Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Great day to be in the house of the Lord, amen. Um, want to greet anybody that's watching online, YouTube, Facebook, Roku, wherever you get your exciting news and um, <laughs> word. Um, I want to start out by uh, thanking this church um, from my family and the Raleigh family. Um, we had the funeral here Friday. Um, we got some flowers from the church. Uh, I don't know which ones they are anymore, but I think it's these. Um, thank you for the flowers. Thank you for letting us use the building. Special thanks to Brother Jeff for helping me through the ceremony and his wife Carmen, Mike and Dee, and Kim for coming, and whoever else I forget. Um, it meant a lot to us that you're here. And even the comment online that you watched and were, were shared with Diana, thank you for that too. Um, so let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, in a world that uh, just keeps getting crazier day by day, Jesus, I cling to your word more and more. I seek your word more and more. We all want your word more and more because it is truth, it is life. It gives us direction in our life, Lord Jesus. Lord, please be present in this service as we speak over your word in Jesus' name. So I performed my first funeral, and uh, it's a lot harder than I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> I give glory to Jesus for getting me through it. Um, I prayed a lot beforehand. Um, so thank you, Lord, I was able to honor my father-in-law. John Raleigh was his name, and my gosh, the sanctuary was full. Um, there were many tears that were shed. <laughs> Uh, and it reminded me of a note that I had written in preparation for the service. And the note said this, If I had lived, and no one sheds a tear, then I have not lived. We all fall short. We all fail. It's all about getting back up and living our life, loving others, caring for others, and helping others. And this got me to thinking about a scripture that I had read, 1 Corinthians 13 says, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love for others, growing out of God's love for me, then I have become only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just an annoying distraction. And if I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people and understand all mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but do not have love of reaching out to others. I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it does me no good at all. I use that version because it translates a little better, because that word love in the Bible in Greek is agape, a very deep, deep and rich sense of love. In the end of John's life was nothing less than terrible. It was very difficult to watch. At times it seemed surreal. I've said it before and I will say it again. Alzheimer's is a horrible disease. It affects much more than just the one person. It affects the whole family. The care that really needs to be provided is usually more than resources will allow. Imagine being a, son, a man's son and finding out that one of the questions he asked was, who is that man on the porch? And that man is you, the son. Honestly, there were moments as literally begging God to just make it stop. I didn't want to see him suffer anymore. He lived to be 82, which is a pretty good age, considering all the medical problems that he had throughout his life. But still, it hurt deeply. And after John passed, we, as we prepared for the celebration of life, Diana asked that I would share a scripture. Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, Christ, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was a tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. There will no longer ex exist anything that is cursed because sin and illness and death are gone. 
and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. They will be privileged to see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be night. They have no need for lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign as kings forever and ever. I love that scripture. And as of late, I've been taking great comfort in it, the promises that are there. Before John passed, Diana and I anointed him with oil. We were praying over him, speaking in our spirit, given heavenly language. And as we were doing that, I was claiming this verse in that moment. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, neither, there, neither shall there be any more pain, but the former things are passed away. What a beautiful, amen, what a beautiful promise in the word of God. But I really began to feel the weight of what is coming compared to what is going on in the world. It's ugly out there. Crime rates are high. In the United States alone, there were 21,156 homicides in 2022, according to Statista. And according to the United Nations Office on Drug and Crimes Global Study on Homicide in 2023, 458,000 people were victims of homicide across the world. One does not have to be a Bible scholar to know that homicide is a no-no. Exodus 20:13 says, thou shalt not kill. There are many that are outside of the faith that will say, look, if there was a God, he wouldn't allow all that murder. He wouldn't allow all that killing. If God was real, real there would be no evil. But they are, what's the word? Ignorant. <laughs> because we, as the body of Christ, we need to look at everything that is happening with a Christian world view. We interpret the events that are happening based on biblical worldview. What is biblical worldview? I'm glad you asked. I'll try to define what I think it is. Um, the first uh, pillar or cornerstone for me of bit looking at the world in a biblical worldview is creation. That God created everything for his purpose. Psalm 147 says, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the broken in heart and binds up their wounds. He tells the numbers of stars, and he calls them all by their names. Pastor Jeff has preached on the failures of Darwinism, and I thank him for doing it. We believe in creation and not evolution. The world may think we are fools, but they have a different world view. Our view of creation is based on the Word of God. The second part of a Christian worldview is the fall, or when sin entered the world. It divided us and, it, and God because God is righteous. The rebellion of man because of sin sent the world and all of mankind on a course where there would be suffering. It is not something that we dance and sing about, but we understand it. Genesis 3.17 says this, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten out of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, thou shalt return to the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust you are you, God, there's a lot of thou's in this one, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That all sounds a little horrible, but there's another part of biblical view, and that's the third one, and that's called redemption. Redemption is the work of Christ who paid the price of redemption through his death, 
resurrection, and resurrection, amen? It was his plan from the beginning. And most of us here today have been redeemed by Christ. Thank you, Jesus, and hallelujah. And if you are not yet saved, you have the opportunity to engage in relationship with Jesus, Jesus, who is God, who is the creator of it all. It's in Acts 2.38. And he does all of this for his glory and for his name. Amen? Okay, then there's a fourth biblical view, which is called consummation. According to God's word, he's bringing the world to consummation. In Matthew 24, Jesus tells his disciples that one day everything they see will be gone will be torn down. And the disciples are like, "Um, could you explain that just a little bit? (laughs) When's this going to happen? And Jesus says, he warns that there's going to be deceivers, uh, deceivers in his name, that there'll be wars, there'll be rumors of wars, but that is not the end. And then in Matthew 24, 11, I'll pick it up. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end will come. God has a plan and there is an end to this world. No matter what the world builds, nothing will stand against the will of God. It will all be gone. All right, bear with me. This is the fifth and final um, Christian worldview cornerstone. Um, It's called the new creation. That's the good news. (laughs) It's in Revelation 21 and 22. That scripture that Diana requested is what got me thinking about all of this. In In IT, I would say that God is going to nuke and pave this world, meaning he will end it and create it anew, just like the scripture says. Then we have that promise. There will no longer exist anything that is cursed because of sin and illness and death are gone, and the throne of God of the Lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. They will be privileged to see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. I'm not confused. I might be a little sore, a little tired from all the preparations of last week, but I'm certain that we are in that period of redemption, where people can be saved through God's grace by hearing his word, by receiving him as their savior, repenting, being baptized in his name, being filled with his Holy Spirit. Amen? But this period of redemption, it's going to come to a close. I know that no one knows the day or the hour, but it seems to me that it is getting near. Again, we are blessed. Pastor Jeff loves end times so much. I looked yesterday as I was preparing this message because if you're watching online and want to know more about end times, um, this is an excellent uh, study. Shameless plug here for you, brother. You can go to Amazon and type Hansen and end time, one word, and it's the fourth entry both on your computer or on your phone. And you can order that study and and do that at home. And if we spend time in the word and we spend some time in prayer, we too can discern it's probably going to be sooner than later. But here's the thing that's really on my heart, that I want the people in my life, I want my friends, I want my family people I work with, heck, even the people I don't even like, the people that don't like me, I want them to have his name on their foreheads. The death of Diana's father, losses of some in this church, are urgently pushing my spirit that we as a church need to do as much as we can to reach those that need Jesus, even if they think they do not need him. (laughs) We've done some things in the past. We have a chili mix. It'll be, what, October 26th at 5 p.m. And please, if you watch online, um, you're welcome. Come fellowship with us. If you know somebody that lives where we in, around us, invite them. Just come on down. We don't bite. And <laughs> you might say to yourself, um, I've invited everyone I know already. They never come. Most of the people that I know are already saved. I get it. We don't hang around with, you know, people that are more of the world. But there is something that all of us can do, and I think we should do, and that's pray. It has been on my heart for a while, as it has been on Diana's, that we start Soak again. So we were going to start it at the beginning of September, but then Diana's father got really sick, and we didn't think it would be right to start it then. So we're going to start it this Friday, 
October 4th at 6 p.m. If you can be there, I know it's a little surprise, but without, if, if we don't take the first step, we're never going to go. Um, so you might ask, what is this soak thing? Um, it's just taking an intentional moment to spend time praising Jesus, to, to read his word, and to pray. Sometimes we have a topic, but I think the focus we need to have is based on the biblical period that we are in, redemption, and the period that's coming after. There's no admission fee. Um, you don't have to bring anything, only a heart open to pray and intercede for this moment in the timeline of God. And if things are moving closer and closer to consummation, the fulfillment of the promises and purposes of God that we see in his word, we need to shift our focus for his glory. Not praying for what we need, but for what the world needs. Praying for the kingdom of God. In our prayers, we need to plead for souls because time is running out. We need to pray for the spread of the gospel across Janesville, across Wisconsin, across the United States, and across the world. And I've mentioned how many churches closed because of COVID, but there are other forces at work that are closing churches. The enemy. And although he loses in the end, he is gaining ground. Let's pray that new churches are planted, that God's word is brought into every corner of the world. When I looked down into the folks that were here for John's funeral, I thought about their souls. And you can be sure that I shared Acts 2.38 with them. They got some word on Friday, trust me. And I could stop there, but I have, and I will continue to pray that each one of them accept accepts the gift of redemption paid with the precious blood of Jesus. I want to be praying for missionaries. God bless each and every one of them. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Jesus, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Even unto the end of the world. That time has come. Jesus has not called me to be a missionary somewhere yet. I hope not. <laughs> that time may come, but until it does come, I want to support them with prayer. I also want to support them financially or with supplies. And I also think that we as a body should find some missionaries and we should find someone to support. We've done it in the past, and though we have fewer folks than we have before, Nowhere in the Bible does it say you need to have 60, 100, or 1,000 members. It always starts with one person doing it for the glory of the one, Jesus. Amen? So <laughs> the title of my message was, was going to be Sower. <laughs> but I wanted, and I wanted to dig into some of Jesus' parables. And as I was thinking and praying about it, um, I wanted to get my thinking aligned with the biblical worldview of re redemption and consummation. I think it's so important that we understand what Jesus is saying in the parables and understand them in that context. And looking at it in the biblical worldview, it made more sense. But we don't have enough time to do all that. <laughs> but I did want to share one thing on the parables. I wanted to get that ready because I'm going to do a series on parables. Okay, so that's why I wanted to make sure we all were on the same page um, with the biblical worldview or at least understand where I'm coming from. Um, but I did want to share one thing on parables today. Um, jumping a little ahead, the disciples have heard what Jesus said about the sower. And they asked, why do you teach in parables? And I imagine that they think instead of a parable, why not say exactly what it means? Just spit it out. But this is Jesus in Matthew 13, uh, 13, 13, I think. This is the reason I speak to the crowds in parables. Because while having the power of seeing, seeing they do not see. And while having the power of hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand and grasp spiritual things. In them, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will hear and keep on hearing, but never understand. And you will look and keep on looking, but never comprehend. For this nation's heart has grown hard. This is very prophetic to me, especially now. This nation, this United States, is turning away from Jesus. We are allowing the word of God to be watered down. Church has become a business model, and it's become about filling seats rather than filling the hearts of people with the word of God. The church has changed, not to be more like Jesus, 
but to be more like the world. Churches are bending what Jesus said to align with the world when it needs to be the other way around. Sermons are built with one line of Scripture and focus on the listener and not Jesus in his word. These folks are playing with fire, and if they're not careful, it may be too late. As Pastor Jeff preached, look up, look up, look up. And with their ears, they hardly hear, and they have tightly closed their eyes. I think this is where we are in America, our home. Folks are choosing not to listen. People do not want to open their eyes. In this information age, it has never been easier to have access to the Word of God. My goodness, most of us have a phone so we can literally carry the Word of God in our pocket. But we must open our eyes, open the app, open the Bible. We must intentionally seek His Word so that we can resist the world trying to transform us and let Jesus transform us. Amen? Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn to me and I would heal them spiritually. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the opportunity to have all of your words so that we can see. Thank you, Jesus, that we can hear what you are saying. Thank you, Jesus, that we can understand and that you heal us. Thank you, Lord, for healing our hearts and our spirit. The worship team can come on up. So now I've laid the groundwork. We'll start, I'm going to start on parables. I'm going to do a series on parables. Um, we are an Acts 238 church. We believe you need to repent, uh, be baptized in Jesus' name, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, Pastor Mike, if the water is cold, graciously volunteered this morning to do all cold water baptisms in Jesus' name. Um, as Pastor Mike said, we have some food downstairs from the funeral on Friday, which you're, you're invited to, to uh, partake in. Um, and the altar is open in Jesus' name. Amen.